Before I begin, I want to lift up the wisdom of Indigenous people who show us a world that is alive and sacred. How we might begin to learn from and honour their perspective is everything that I hope my life can circle around and get closer to. But my life was forged in London, the epicentre of some pretty dominant stories about how we should organise the world. Stories that in some ways are the antithesis to the woven threads of Indigenous wisdom. Stories that see London as home to extraction and hierarchy. The Industrial Revolution, capitalism, colonialism, the slave trade, white supremacy, patriarchy. That is a lot of systemic injustice baked into my geography and into the context that made me. I'm Tamsin, a 37-year-old white, non-binary trans person who, for the past 16 years, has been relentlessly involved in the environmental movement. Now, for the first 10 years of that journey, I approached climate as though it was somehow separate to me, like it was a problem that could be beat if I could just campaign and change a particular piece of legislation or provoke a public conversation about a specific aspect of our carbon intensive lifestyles, then maybe, just maybe, global temperatures would peak, would begin to come down, and we could all just carry on as normal. But what is normal? A normal where rich nations hoard COVID vaccines and spend 2.3 times more militarizing our borders than we do on helping those countries who have contributed least to climate change and are devastated right now by its impacts. A normal where we are valued by the profit we produce rather than by the courage and kindness of our hearts. The climate and ecological emergency is not a problem to be solved. It is our context now, shaped by us and by over 400 years of white Western dominance. It is a symptom of injustice, racial, economic, gender, intergenerational, all rooted in the exploitation of the many to give enormous wealth and power to a very small few. The climate emergency is proof, if we needed it, that there is something broken in our relationships with each other, with ourselves and with our planet. Audrey Lord taught us that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. This climate emergency, this context we created, it isn't something any of us can beat or escape. Our aching planet is inviting us to stop, to examine the power-hungry forces in our lives and our cultures, and to transform so that we might heal our relationship with the planet, yes, and with each other. We have dominated nature, forcing it to provide our every consumer want. Instead of care and respect, we have extracted. And even at this point of environmental crisis, we show few signs of slowing down. Instead, we have pushed ourselves and our planet, ignoring our natural limits because our culture tells us that without pushing, without consuming, without striving and endlessly doing, we are not enough. I want to rip that idea out from me and out from so many people who I love. That being myself is somehow not enough. Instead, I want to prioritise the things in my life which give me meaning, connection, belonging, purpose, joy. And to do this, I need to turn quickly away from the myth of individual success and towards the truth of collective resilience. 
Now, I am a millennial, a child of the individualist myth. I know what it is to have an appetite that cannot be satisfied, or to feel that my life is a competition, that the things I want are scarce, and that to get them, it is me versus you. I've been dissatisfied with where I am, hungry to get somewhere else, exhausting myself getting there, and then disappointed when I discovered that the place, position, goal, ambition that I had fought so hard to get didn't fill me up after all. It is hard to untangle ourselves from the idea that only through accumulating can we be happy. It is hard to trust that purpose, joy, belonging can be enough. But I have been alongside people and created experiences that have shown me time and again that nothing worth doing is done alone. From stepping out onto the roofs of Parliament and dropping banners against the third runway at Heathrow, to walking out into the road alongside Greta Thunberg on the first day of Extinction Rebellion, these things happened because we gathered a community, identified a shared vision, and then did the slow and sturdy work, organising our community into a force that could deliver that vision, petition by petition fundraiser towards a fundraising goal, through conflict, communicating until we reached a resolution, setting our boundaries, having those boundaries trampled all over and then reasserting them, campaigning with effort and focus until we won and then celebrating those victories. These shared experiences, at whatever scale, bind us to one another and to the vision that we co-create. The climate an ecological emergency is our reality now. We can't escape it, so instead we have to decide who will we be in the midst of it and who will we stand alongside. Building community isn't easy, especially in a world where algorithms reward us with dopamine hits the more antagonistic we are. But love, patience, tolerance, these are the only building blocks we have to thrive through coming storms. We can see that when disaster hits, the best of our humanity can leap to the rescue. Whether it's the community organizing that brought food and water to the most vulnerable following Hurricane Sandy, or the tens of thousands of self-organized mutual aid groups that grew up and supported people throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. We can build vibrant and resilient communities when we are on the knife edge of disaster. Our challenge is to build those communities now, Build that resilience into our lives now, rather than crossing our fingers and hoping that it will emerge when disaster strikes. Because it is only through the communities we form and the ways we find to work together that we will change the world and be changed too. Now, exactly one month ago, I had a double mastectomy as part of my transition. As I mentioned, I'm trans, non-binary, and this was gender-affirming healthcare. Explaining that would probably need to be a whole other TED talk, and to be honest, there are people more confident than me talking about their experience of being trans, but it is important to say now, because whilst I've been recovering, feeling more fragile than I have ever felt before, I understood that I am held by all the relationships that my life is embedded within. As I circle more closely to the me I've always been but didn't know how or feel safe to show, I am strengthened by the courage of trans people who came before me and who lived and died with no idea how their example of living was carving out space for me. Our relationships don't just exist in the present, they reach back 
through history and forwards to the world that has not yet begun. My trans ancestors, trans elders in my community imagined this. This world where I can stand here proudly. They made it possible for me. We can imagine a world free from injustice and through our relationships with people in the past who made the world this way, with people in the present who are ready to be part of our community and with every single life that follows ours. We can make good things happen. We can transform the world. Within your life, your family, your friends, your community, your career, you already know what more you can do to respond to the climate emergency. Now, you need to find your people who will hold you to account and encourage you to do it. Because no one person is going to save the day. The world is too massive and complex for that. Instead, the invitation is there for us to build our communities so that we can become the people who, seven generations from now, will be remembered gratefully. Thank you.